So this example is actually uh, published by uh, McKinsey. And it says that uh, there are many ways that a buyer and a manufacturer and the retailers uh, can offer value, right? The first one is a traditional one where, let's say this is uh, Giant, and Giant buys something from uh, uh, P&G, right? Uh, anything. So P&G will make the product, packet them, and then distribute into Giant, uh, and then let Giant do the manage the inventory and display the inventory. Okay? So this is a very traditional way between retailer and, and manufacturer. A more aggressive one is now, instead of just uh, distributing the product to the uh, PNG, uh, to the giant, you now manage their inventory for them. So when they need, then you send and di display on the shelf for them. All right? So you don't really go into their warehouse anymore. That means uh, when their shelf goes empty, you will then bring the inventory to that particular store and display onto their shelf, right? So that is a bit more advanced, but it's still not the best solution. The best is that, let's say Giant, they will give you that space, the shelf space, and let you decide what are the product you want to display on that shelf. And you must manage that inventory every day, make sure that there are product display. Otherwise, they will give that space to your competitor. Okay, so you are now doing assortment planning. So let's say if you are selling, let's say you are P&G, you are selling uh, shampoo. You have uh, this kind of size, you have one meter size and all that. You decide what you want and you display on the shelf. Right, so we call this assortment planning. So now you as a, a manufacturer, you do everything. So you make, you packet, you distribute, you, in, you keep for them, and then you retail for them. That means you decide what is the SKU good for each store, and then you deliver to them, and then you display on the shelf. So this is uh, the highest end in that end. I, so far, I have not seen any in Malaysia that does that yet. It's not so advanced. Okay, so, but it is something that will deliver more value by letting the supplier do more things. Last time the supplier only do three steps. Now the supplier do five steps. Right. Rest. Can I know uh, yeah. which, which company using this model already? The, in, it's in the US, uh, Walmart do a lot of that. Walmart, Walmart do a lot of that. Yes. So Walmart, they, they actually ask the PNG, Unilever to deliver and also to do a assortment planning for them. So they do a lot of these things. In the US, they are more advanced in this kind of uh, uh, retail manufacturing relationship. With this, this means that you can handle a lot of uh, SKU? Uh, no, with this, it means that I leave it to the manufacturer to decide what they want to display on the shelf. Then a lot of SKU can, can, can Yes, they, they can put it into the shelf. Because yes. it's fast moving. Uh. Yeah, but they have to decide what type of SKU they want to put on the shelf. So now they make decision. Uh, last time, the uh, uh, the retailer will make decision. They think this one is best, but they not. They are not sure. Uh, yes. Is this considered as VMI? Uh, yes, it's still a VMI because the vendor manage the inventory. Yes. So this one, the step two is really VMI. Step three, go beyond VMI. They also help them to do a assortment planning. A assortment planning is to decide what what SKU to display on the shelf. And this is something very advanced, and you need to have a very strategic relationship between the retailer and the manufacturer. Right, very strategic. If you are small suppliers, uh, you normally don't do this kind of thing. It's a lot of work. It's like extra work given to the suppliers. Right? But what is good about this is that the supplier can lock in the customer. Now that space is yours. So now you can put almost everything you want there. Right, so they lock can lock your customer. Okay. So there's something good about this design principle, basically locking your customer. Um, so that's what we call uh, relocate of work to your customer and supplier. And it has been very successful in e-government, in VMI, and also in uh, e-commerce, right where you do the data entry. 
The next one, I think this is something quite common, everybody, it's quite common sense also, is to look at minimizing interfaces between you and your customer. All right? When you have too many contact points, your customers also get confused. Who to call? Uh, which department to call when there's a problem? So try to minimize interfaces between you and your customer. And if possible, automate that. That will be good. Right? Try to automate that interface. And you can see that uh, an example is kiosk. Kiosk can be used as an interface between you and your customer. Instead of going into uh, uh, you know, calling you or help desk. The trouble today is that uh, many of them use what? Telephone answering machine, right? You go to the bank, they ask you to call this number and then number one is this, number two, until you say number nine is this, then you press number nine. So uh, again, there are some laws of con intimacy, right? Because you're not, no longer talking to a person, you're talking to a machine, and some people are not very happy with that. So that is something maybe not very uh, suitable if you find that your customer felt that there's a loss of customer intimacy. Another one could be that uh, uh, it's not uh, able uh, to maintain consistency in organizing the, you know, the reply. So uh, it, it becomes very uh, inconsistent, as well as uh, a lot of uh, rec resonation. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So uh, uh, this is an example from uh, Singapore, right? Where um, if I want to ship my cargo overseas, all right? If I want to ship my cargo overseas, I have to contact uh, the shipper, have to contact the freight forwarding company. Then the freight forwarding company will then check what is the available vessel for booking and then whether uh, the depot have container, empty container for them to staff. And once okay, they will confirm with the shipper, okay, this date is okay, right? So then they will uh, arrange for the empty container uh, to be trucked into the, the uh, warehouse and then load up the goods and then they will book uh, a, a time to be uh, unloaded into the port where the vessel will come in and then they will get shipped out. Now this whole thing here, that was the study that was done, only three areas are electronically connected. One is between the freight, uh, the truckers and the port operator to book the time. We call it the TT time into the port, right? You need to have the time arranged to go into the port. Not everybody can go anytime. The second is the interface between the carrier and the depot operator who owns all this empty container. Most of the empty container are owned by carrier like NOL, uh, all, all kind of uh, Casco and all that. And the next thing is that the third electronic connection is between the custom decoration system and your freight forwarding company. The rest of it are manually done by phone call, fax, right? And uh, also by SMS, very, very traditional. So what they did was to see how they can make all this into a single point of contact and that's so they re-engineered their whole process today in Singapore and this whole thing is now called TradeNet TradeNet plus Trade Exchange sometimes we call it Trade Exchange so now the freight forwarder uh, when you, the shipper call the freight forwarder the freight forwarder will have a portal it will lock into a portal called Trade Exchange that can book carrier all right, book the PSA port and then uh, book the uh, uh, book the decorations and also apply decorations, as well as um, they can also buy insurance on behalf of the customer, the shippers, and 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 many other things that can be done. Now they can do it online before the the ship arrive and then ship it out. So it's a single point of contact now through the freight forwarding company. They will just lock into the system and do everything electronic. So now all these are electronically connected and including 
insurance and payment, LC payment between bank to bank. Now this are uh, changing the whole way uh, trades are concerned. Okay? So this trade kind of trade logistics has evolved from very manual to very electronic. Okay? And uh, for this, uh, it has also reduced the processing time. Used to be, if you look at the previous one, it used to take three to four days to get all these things done. Three to four days. Today with this, all this can be done within a day. All right. If you if you uh, need to ship out by tonight and they have a, a space for you and the ship is uh, arriving, you can get all these things done. But, but the problem is how to interface the different operator. Uh, these are done system. behind the scene. So yes. when you log in into Trade Exchange now, mm -hmm. right? You just have to tell them where you want to ship to and all that, and then what which vessel are you want you want to book? You will book. You can then go and book on the same platform. What I mean is a synchronized system together, so that it, all the information can be yes, together. they do that they in do the that. trade exchange. Yes, all the information are synchronized. So Singapore is that but Malaysia very hard. Well, I think uh, I think you should give some time and then we be able to evolve as well. So basically, the whole idea is to have a single point of attack so that everything, all the information, as you say, are consolidated at one point. And then behind the scene, they will redistribute to the different owners for processing. Okay. 